don't need that. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm a bit like a rabbit in headlights because Liz only told me on the way down that there'd be uh, close to 300 people listening to me, so I was kind of going, oh, God, no, here we go. Um, my name is Bernie. Um, I was diagnosed in November of 2012. I found a lump myself <clears throat> and kind of waited for about a week till I kind of said, oh, I better do something about this. So I went to my doctor, was, was sent off into the breast check clinic and spent a day in there um, between all sorts of tests, etc. And then I uh, had to wait till five o'clock in the evening for uh, this lovely, very tall man walked down the corridor with a folder in his hand, which is my file, and he says, come on, we'll have a chat. Wasn't diagnosed straight away. I actually asked him had I got cancer, but he wouldn't answer. So it took another two weeks before they actually called me in and said, yes, you do have cancer. So two weeks after that, I had my first surgery and then uh, went back two weeks later for the results and uh, back in again, they hadn't got it all. So I'm back in uh, the next day, actually, because he actually said to me I could wait a week or, go, week or go the next day and me as I am, I just said, Asha, come on, we'll do it tomorrow. So I went back in the next day, had my surgery and then on the 18th of December, 2012, I'll always remember that date, he actually, I went back in for my checkup and he said to me, you're cancer free. So I went, yay, Grace, that's lovely now. And I was really sore and all that sort of stuff. And I said, okay, what do we do now? So it was a case of my journey was going to start. And it was um, eight weeks of chemotherapy, followed by an extra 12 weeks. And then that would bring me into the summer. And I'd have seven and a half weeks of radiotherapy, or chemo first, sorry, and then radiotherapy. So um, I had, did all I had to do. There's lots of checks done with you. There's lots of blood tests and did all that anyway. And then the end of January, I started my chemo. And um, the first lot of chemo, they told me it was going to be the hard stuff. So I went in for my first day, absolutely bricking it I was. Went in anyway and saw these two massive big syringes and I sort of thought, they're not for me. So one was a kind of a goldy color and the other was clear. So immediately I actually decided, okay, Southern Comfort and Seven Up, sure, where could you go wrong? <laughs> so every two weeks for eight weeks, I went in and had me Southern Comfort and Ginger, or Seven Up, and it was fine, it was grand. Um, you know, I went in, I was actually in the St. Vincent's uh, war, St. Vincent's uh, day, day room in the matter, and uh, I was looking around, and at that stage when I started the, the, uh, the treatment, full head of hair, looked quite normal, everything grand, there was a lot of sick people in the room. And it was only then that I kind of, <clears throat> I need me water. It was only then that I kind of thought, oh my God, am I going to look like this in a few weeks time? And um, I kind of, I was probably, to be honest, like I was 52 then, I was probably one of the younger people in that room, but um, I sort of, sorry, dry mouth, my lips are sticking to my teeth. <laughs> Grand. Last day there? Yes. So, um, anyway, start the treatment, everything great. I kept slagging the nurses every time I went in. I kept saying, are you sure you're giving me stuff? Because I said, I feel brilliant. They kept saying to me, any side effects, they didn't know what they were talking about. So they kept, I was on a lot of medication at that stage when you're going through it because, because chemo attacks your, your, cell, your blood cells. You have to build up your cells again to go back in again for them to destroy them again. That's just the way it works. So um, I was grand, not a bother on me, and then we got through all that. On the second, after my second session, I actually noticed my hair was starting to come out. <clears throat> so at that stage, everything that I knew, I, I'm, I'm a bit of a control freak, so everything I knew of my life that I could control was gone. So the only thing I could actually control at that stage was my hair. So rang my hairdresser and I said, it's time. So she said, grand, so went down, had the hair shaved, and I actually rocked the Sinead collar, collar look, I have to admit. <laughs> Didn't look too bad now at all. So be just before that, I'd be given advice to go to the wig people, let them see what you look like, and get a wig as close to what you look like at that stage. Did all that anyway, and then about a week before my hair fell out, I'd gone back to them, and I picked up my wig, and then, as I said, got the hair shaved and went home. Tried the wig on at home and it was just, I cried all the way through shaving my head, by the way. I know it's probably, people say, oh, like, you know, it's only your hair. But that defines you. As a woman, it defines you. Maybe as a man as well, I don't know, but it could do. So what, and what happened then was, I used to go home, 
I went home, tried the wig on. I have two children, and um, my son kept saying, Mom, try the wig on again. I went, no, 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 I can't do this. And then I did anyway, and I sort of thought, oh, sure, look, it'll be grand. But I used to think of very strange, that I'd wake up every morning, and the wig was sitting on a polystyrene head. And it's weird when you wake up in the morning, you look over, and your hair is winking at you. <laughs> so anyway, she got a name. Her name was Lucy. So every morning I woke up and said, how are you, Lucy? What are we going to do today? So that's how I got through. Lucy and I had a great relationship. So um, went through all that, did everything. And then I started my second lot of chemo, which was to be the lesser of the two evils, as I called it. But it wasn't, because I had one dose of it. And I was going every week for 12 weeks. And then I went in to have my second one. And um, I, I wasn't well. I was very ill. And I had to be admitted and ended up in a high dependency unit for a week. The chemo attacked my lungs. So basically, I couldn't breathe. So I don't remember much about the week because I was obviously out of it for most of it. And then I spent another week and a half in the matter after that. So my, kind of, my journey got a bit disrupted in, in the middle because I had a plan. I knew I had all this to go through. And then all of a sudden, no, we can't give you any more chemo because we'll kill you. So I kind of went, OK, what happens now? felt cheated because I kind of felt I put my faith in my doctors, which I still had a lot of faith in them. But as far as I was concerned, that was my journey. It was my plan. All of a sudden, it wasn't. So they just said, look, they were very happy I took to the first slot, the Southern Comfort and 7-Up. And I went, OK, grand. And they were quite happy that I, they, I would be all right. So I started a, a hormone in, um, tablet then. And then in July of that year, I started my seven and a half weeks of radiotherapy. And then I went back to work in the uh, middle of September. Um, a bit like Liz, um, I was covered for only a certain amount of time I was out of work. I was the breadwinner. I had a 17-year-old and I had a 22-year-old. 17-year-old had um, just finished school. 22-year-old was in second year college. And I was there kind of going, how the hell am I going to get through this? So um, I, had, I had my wages for a certain amount of time, then I had to go on social welfare. And um, when I was diagnosed with cancer, I rang my building society to say, I don't know, what, I don't know what's happened here. I didn't know the journey I was going to make, have never had cancer before. And they more or less said, well, your mortgage has to be paid. They didn't entertain me in any way. So some months they got the money and some months they didn't. Because it was a case of sitting down and actually working out whether I could pay an ESB bill or whether I needed heating. As Liz said, you're very cold all the time. So it was either get a fill of oil or pay half my mortgage, and that's the way I did it. I had no choice. So um, I'll be honest, last year, like I was diagnosed in 2012, so 2013 was when everything happened. So it was only um, kind of middle of last year that I have got myself back on the straight and narrow in relation to my mortgage. It's after taking me that long because family and friends were so supportive, they really were. I borrowed from them too. But you have to pay them back. I had to pay them back. They didn't want the money back, but I had to pay them back. That's just the way I am. So there's a hell of a lot of cost factors involved in when, you, when you're sick. I, was, I did get a medical card. I didn't have one. Um, I got one when I was diagnosed. It took a while to come through. I'd actually paid for my surgeries, for uh, the anaesthetics and all that, because the hospitals kept send, sending me bills. I'd never been in hospital before, so I didn't know. You can just delay them. And I was a bit kind of stupidly enough kind of thought, oh, what if I don't pay the bills now? I'll go in, they won't give me my treatment. That's the way I thought. Paid the bills anyway, and then, of course, the card came, and they said to me, oh, you should have delayed, but they didn't tell me at the time. Anyway, so I had to pay all those, and then I got my card. That paid for my wig, because they held off, charged me for the wig until the card came, which was great. So the card covered my medical costs, as in it covered my tablets, because as Liz said, you're on it, you're on it. Oh, my God, I think I was on. When I came out of hospital, between steroids to kind of build up my lungs because I had none, um, and, and everything else was on. I think it was on something like 42 tablets a day. So if I jumped up and down, I'd rattle. So <laughs> basically, so that's what it was covered. It was covered by the card. But financially, you're a mess because it's very hard to turn to your... My, my son wasn't working. My daughter was in college, and she had a part-time job. It's very hard to turn around and tell them, I don't have the money for this, and I didn't. So when I went back to work too, I mean, that's hard as well because you do suffer from chemo brain is where you can't remember things. And the slightest little thing that you had done for years 
you can't remember. I couldn't remember the programs on the computer. I couldn't remember how to find things. It was actually soul destroying, I have to admit. It really was soul destroying. And in relation to the Comfort Fund, you see, I only got to know the Marie Keaton Foundation in 2013, but I'd gone through all my stuff anyway, and I didn't know about the Comfort Fund. Had I known about the Comfort Fund, it would have been great because I actually talk, tell people about it all the time now. Because even if it's only 200 euro or 300 euro or whatever it is, that's a huge weight off your shoulders when you've no money. It really genuinely is. I too, I refinanced it, all that stuff in 2008, so I went through a divorce. So um, I didn't know about your income cover either. That was never specified to me when I took out my insurance. So of course my brother rang me in, uh, when I was actually going through all my stuff and he said to me, check your insurance, he said, I think you may be covered for your mortgage. And of course I wasn't because I didn't have it, because I didn't know about it. So it would have been a different kettle of fish, it would have been so much less stressful on, on you going through your treatment if you'd known all this, but I didn't know it. Anyway, so went back to work, did all that stuff, and then I only went back to work part-time, I did three days a week. I had to go back to work because I needed the money. I needed to go back on full salary. Now they did put me back on full salary even though I wasn't working five days, I was only working three. So they were very good to me when I went back, but it took a long time. It took a long time for me to get back to <clears throat> not the person I was because I never could be. You can never go back, you have to look forward. So I was going to be a very different person, which I was. And like I met up with the Marie Keaton Foundation in 2013 because during that year I did uh, the, the walk in the park. Yeah, your, your pig's back run. Um, I did that, I did uh, the pink run. I had actually lost um, two very good friends and a family member to cancer in the same year. So I was kind of going, okay, these, I'm doing this for you. So I did. And then, um, sorry, <coughs> um, I'm involved in a musical society and I was chairperson when my cancer decides to visit, so I had to give all that up. And my defining moment that year was in November, we put a big show on in our theatre in Blanchardstown and I was on stage. And I was determined when I was sick, I was definitely going to be on that stage and I was. So that's when I turned around and I said, right cancer, go F off and leave me alone. So that's when I decided that. So I've done a few things since. <clears throat> I've been involved in two Caminos, I'm going on a third one. I've done fashion shows, I'm no model butcher, who cares? Um, I do, I've done lots of stuff. I've gone on fabulous holidays and everything. And when I say, my cancer journey, I don't call it that anymore. I actually call it that I'm dancing with cancer because I have it back again. I have bone cancer. I was diagnosed with it last, um, last, last June. I was only back from holidays in the States a week. I had a very bad pain in my back when I was away. Came back and I was in hospital in a week. So I've had surgery, <clears throat> I had um, vertebrae removed, and I'm now the bionic woman because I put a plate in and nine bolts. <clears throat> Sorry. So I'm going on holidays now in, in uh, June, <clears throat> and I'm dying to set all the alarms off, because that's my mission now, <laughs> in Dublin airport, and I go, hey, hey, I'm here. So, you know, the stress of, not be, of, of being sick is bad enough, but the financial worries on top of that is huge, absolutely huge. So I reiterate what Liz said, if, if it can be explained to people, even at a young age, and they look at you as if you're 50 heads, about the protection, the cover, because that is so important. I mean, I never, I, it wasn't stressed to me, I know for a fact it wasn't. It was kind of mentioned but brushed over, no one explained what it was. But at that stage anyway, I, I was indif indispensable. I was never going to get anything wrong with me. Sure, why they asked me to cover in case I'm out of work? Sure, I had never been out of work in nearly 40 years. So why would I think about it so? <clears throat> Sorry, excuse me, so I, um, yeah, I wish I had known. It would have been a different journey altogether. Um, I'm still here. I intend to be here for a while. I'm one of those statistics that was on that board earlier on. I'm on a, um, a tablet, um, which I uh, was only brought into the country at the end of last year. So I'm on that now. I'm uh, doing really well. Um, and I intend to be around for a lot longer. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm done.
Sorry. Hey, thanks so much. It's terrible. It's terrible. Thanks. Thanks so much.